What does Super Mario 3D World hide from the player in World 1? And how does the game work from behind the scenes? There's plenty of secrets and hidden things to be found in games that developers intentionally hide for players to encounter during normal gameplay, like the 2D Luigi's all around 3D World. And, well, there's a lot of other stuff that the player can't normally see behind the scenes. From how a game is built, to how the maps are laid out, to leftover assets that developers may have forgotten about. And that's what we're focusing on today. We're heading through World 1's Super Bell Hill, Koopa Trooper Cave, Charge and Chuck's Blockade, Mount Beanpole, Plessy's Plunging Falls, Switch Scramble Circus, Bowser's Highway Showdown, and Captain Toad Goes Forth to show you stuff you may have not seen before. So, I hope you enjoy this behind the scenes look. Game breaking videos of course take a while to make, and it's through the generous support of games like Tactical that make it all possible. Tactical is an award winning top down squad based shooter that's a ton of fun. Out of 30 million players, you and four of their teammates battle out against another team of five in different competitive game types within a destructible environment on iOS, Android, or PC. You can even fight zombies or hop in a vehicle to change the tide of battle. There's 80 real life weapons and fully customizable characters, including, uh, Snack. He looks familiar, but don't worry about it. Personally, I love the strategy aspect of working with your squad. Hunting down players who aren't watching the back is a lot of fun when you smack them with your vehicle. It's just so satisfying. Community is a big deal in the game, where you can join a clan and voice chat with your peers from around the world. The bonds people have formed are kind of incredible. From stories of a player meeting her husband through the game, to veterans connecting together to form a clan, with a family-like bond based on their past experiences. So as you can see, there's quite a lot going on in the tactical community. So, if you want to join the battle like I did, you can download the game by clicking my link in the description below, or scanning the QR code on screen now. New players who use the code TACTIDE will get an exclusive bonus, including the Operator Jason, a RPG, and 50,000 silver. And a huge thanks to Tactical for supporting me as a creator and sponsoring this video. So I've spent a lot of time breaking this game before and uncovering some strange stuff. But before jumping into any level, let's talk about the world map. So in case you are curious, there's a lot of floating islands around the World 1 area that look like they would be great areas to climb given their Minecraft blocky-like appearance. But trying to jump to these areas will cause a player to fall through them. When we hit the death barrier, it immediately warps us back to ground we can walk on again. We can jump over the river and go right into the Toad House though. Toad houses don't have any backgrounds beyond the framing that you can see, so trying to look around with a camera will cause screen smearing. This is because the background area isn't refreshing frame-wise like the interior of the Toad House is. So we can smear it around like a paintbrush. And just in case you were curious, no items are stored in the boxes either, so we can't visually cheat to see what we'll get. Back on the map, even if we attempt to jump into Bowser's castle early, we will be unable to open the doors to go in. We can just walk inside the castle's model though if we jump into it, and it's a small empty room. Let's move on to our first level though. Super Bell Hill, also known as Enter Cat Mario Stage in the game files, is the opening level of the game. And I always like this level's little diorama, because although these are supposed to be a basic summary or simplified view of what to expect in the level, it kind of hints that there's a secret area with a clear pipe behind this giant paved hill. This doesn't exist in the level itself though. Heading inside the level now, let's start things off with an overarching view of the map. There's plenty going on in this iconic stage, and we'll be taking it step by step. A lot of the areas in this map don't actually touch the water in case you were wondering. There is a lot of cool stuff in the background, however, so let's check it out. Look at this rock! It's a rock! And the bottom is cut off. Fascinating! I was curious to see if we could walk on any of these towers back here, as there are quite a few things out here. And unknown to the player, back by these towers up in the sky is where the underground section of this map is stored. It's contained in a black box, so the player can't see its true location when underground, but it's basically in front of the rainbow. Looking at this inside of an editor makes this a lot more apparent, as objects and areas won't unload or be called out by the camera. So when we go into this area, we're actually warping way over here. It's kind of neat to think about. Back in the game, trying to reach any of these background places with poor old Luigi results in his death. And even if he didn't die, he'd just fall through them. So it's a lost cause. I'll talk about why in just a moment. So as we move along, we come across a series of Goombas that start entering a pipe the second we get near them. However, looking at them idle, you can kind of see that their animation doesn't 100% loop. This is probably because they're being forced to stand still and not move. Looking at this world in the editor again, you can see all sorts of boxes with lines going back and forth all around the map. This is a visualization of the rail and path systems that the game uses. What you're seeing is the track that the camera follows automatically based on the player's position, and also the paths that enemies can walk on if assigned to a rail. 
These lines can also sometimes show grouping between objects. Just beyond the middle of the level, we'll find clear pipes, and each of these pipe pieces can be rotated and moved. If you were to flip one of the pipe pieces, you'll see that in-game it will reflect this rotation. So if we go in the pipe, we'll now go at the top like we altered it to do. Any pipes that have open ends originating from this particular setup here will get automatically plugged as you can see. But let's go back to why Luigi died out of bounds now. Obviously, we know he fell to his death, but we can take a look at the actual death regions too. Toggling them on, you can see just how far out they go, which is honestly kind of insane. Look at this region at the end of the map. This blue rectangle goes insanely far out into the ocean past the end of the stage. It's definitely overkill, but entering this zone will kill the player immediately. These invisible zones aren't only for death areas though, as they also can be water. And the visible portion of water itself is a separate object that is usually then placed inside a transparent water zone area. Water without a water zone wouldn't function as water. And on this map, the developers forgot to delete a water zone that we can access. It's in an area that most players would not think to look, mostly because it's dangling over a cliff and you can't visibly see it. But if we jump off a level right here at a certain angle, we can find ourselves landing in a pool of flooding water. It just looks like our boy Luigi is swimming in the sky. It's hard to tell where the beginning and end of this water zone is though, so it's a bit easy to die. Looking at this area in the editor though, we can see that it is a cube positioned at about a 45 degree angle right off the cliff. So it's easier to enter the box at the corner to avoid falling to your death. If we have been in the game already, a rocket ship will spawn on the world map, but also in the background of this very first level. Taking a closer look, we can see that this rocket is absolutely enormous when inside the level. The rocky platform it sits on goes way beneath the surface of the water as well. What I found interesting is that the reflection on the rocket's window is actually this level. Now, this is surprising to me because the window of the rocket is never more than a few pixels on screen, and the player cannot zoom into the rocket a whole lot either, other than trying to use the binoculars. But as we move the camera around, you can see that a flat overhead image of this map is used as a reflection on the window and the rocket itself. It is tethered to the camera's view and moves when it moves. It's a really nice detail that most players won't ever see. So now we're going to move on from this level to Koopa Troopa Cave, also known as Noko Noko Cave Stage in the game files. So Koopa Troopa Cave, as the name suggests, is a cave you must pass through to reach the grassy area on the other side. So we have this starting area, the cave itself, and then this ending area with the flag. There are also two secret areas here too. So this outside area doesn't have a whole lot other than a dancing Luigi, and if we move the camera around, we won't see much else in the world. But these flashes of black on the left side of the screen are a hint. Once inside the cave, we can take a look at the zoom out of the cave itself. Normally, there are giant invisible walls preventing you from falling out of the cave. Certain objects are unloaded because of the camera range, but you can see that falling changes the entire lighting conditions for the cave, and suddenly everything got bright before Luigi died. This is because this underground cave is stored in the sky, and when Luigi fell out of it, the daytime lighting was restored. It's definitely weird being able to jump out of the cave at any time and just wall kick against the flat sides of it. Looking at this map as a whole, it's insanely spread out, giving Mario Galaxy vibes. We can see how the underground area is stored within this massive black box, way to the left of where we start in this map. Behind this, we can find the other two secret areas, both of which are floating even farther out in the ocean. Seeing it from this perspective, you can see the starting area here, which then takes you over to the big cave over here. We then have the two secret areas right here, and the end of the level is this other floating island over here. I just love how this cave flows. The level design is honestly really superb. There's a lot of things you can miss, and it encourages you to explore. So as we move on in the cave, we eventually come to some cloud platforms that are moving. So the way this works is kind of simple. They have an invisible wall above you that prevents you from moving upwards. And cloud platforms can't crush you, so you fall straight through. The camera rail system crops out what's really happening above and below you, and if we rotate our view, we can see these platforms actually cycle endlessly behind the wall. If there wasn't a roof or death barrier, you could ride them around endlessly. Right past this section, we have a box that is filled with miniature Goombas. As soon as you break the box, they pop out. But peeking inside the box will show us that no Goombas actually exist within the box itself, until the box is broken. So the way this works is there's an object called a Kribo Mini Generator inside the box that detects once the box has been smashed. And then it immediately spawns a certain number of small Goombas in a radial effect. But we can crank this up so that 50 mini Goombas come out of this one box. Having them follow us to the pipe is an interesting sight, as they all try to funnel in at once. 
Eventually, some begin to fall off the stage, and if we look down below, we'll see them floating downward in the endless void. Speaking of Goombas, there's also a stack of Goombas that works the same way here. You may have seen me messing with stacked enemies a few years back, but we can crank up this stack quite a ways. So much so that the enemy stack goes through the top of the cave and way out of bounds. And this is only a fraction of how tall these towers can be. But we grab our star and defeat these bad boys one by one with a catsuit. Next up, we're going to head into Charging Chuck's Blockade, also known in the game files as Gatekeeper Bull Level 1 Stage. That's quite the mouthful. We have a small room with two Charging Chucks that upon defeat spawn us a star. As you may have guessed, this arena is contained within a black box floating out in the middle of the sky. However, unlike other areas like this, this room does indeed have four walls instead of three. The player can never see this wall though, because the camera can't fully rotate. And the side the player does look at has back face culling, so we see right through it. So something I found interesting is that way out of bounds in this level, we have an area that the player cannot access that alters the sound of the game. Now, I'll be honest, I do not know what these regions do exactly, but my hunch based on their name and seeing them elsewhere are that they change the pitch or tone of any sound effects played within them. Sort of like if you're in a small carpeted room versus being in a giant stone cathedral. Your voice would sound different due to the scale and building materials of the space. So I did move this sound region over to the area we play in, and I also added some more chucks and made one big and one small. When playing this level, I can't hear a noticeable change in the sound effects though. So I'm not entirely sure what to make of this out of bounds sound box. Fighting the different chucks was fun though. The little guy moved so fast. Jumping from this over to the gambling area, we can take this place for a spin as well. As you may have guessed, the stage icon's slot machine wheels are fully round. So if we do take a look inside, we'll see the wheels making a full rotation. This level is called Roulette Room Zone in the game files. Entering the level, we are once again in a room in the middle of a blood red void. Unlike the last level, we don't have an actual fourth wall in this room. It's merely an invisible barrier. Luigi's a gambling man, and if we zoom out and complete this matching game, we'll see that the coins just kind of appear out of thin air. To mess with this area, we're going to duplicate some of these slot machine blocks to cheat our way to a gambling victory. Just don't try this in Vegas. We're also going to flip over one of these fairy NPC characters and one of the blocks too. Starting up the game, we can see that the objects don't load in upside down, but we can go ahead and start hitting all the blocks. As long as all these slots are assigned to the same game management object, they will all contribute to the reward, I believe, as long as we don't make more than two matches. So our coins will be compounded as we won both a three of a kind and a two of a kind. After our time spent in Vegas, we're now heading into Mount Beanpole, also known as Climb Mountain Stage in the game files. This is a vertical climbing level with two secret areas, one being underground and another being in the clouds. You can see that way off to the left, above the level, we can find the cloud area that we normally can warp to. And off to the right, obscured by a giant black box, is the underground pipe area. The clouds are placed pretty far away from the rest of the map, and in a little bit, we'll be messing with them. So there are a few things I want to check out here. One, I want to talk about moving blocks. Two, I want to talk about the massive piranha plant. And three, I want to talk about trees and the catsuit. So we'll encounter these moving blocks right beneath the pipe area, and they basically bounce back and forth between these two points. As you can imagine, that's quite literally how it's set up. There is a path that these objects follow, and if we move one of the path points, the blocks will follow to wherever we placed it. Heading back up here, you'll see that the blocks themselves retain their own rotation and don't conform to the direction of the path, which creates this stair step effect. Moving on to the big boy in the back, we can scale this massive piranha plant up and make it three times its normal size. We can also move the cloud zone to the main map so that we can jump on the clouds up above and appreciate this giant lad. Just look at how big he is! Jumping on down, this enemy is so large that his attack goes well beyond us. We can simply stay near him and he can't hurt us at all. Because of this, we can take him down pretty easily. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are the bell trees. So there's two variants of these bell trees, the shorter ones and the tall ones. If Luigi has the cat suit ability, he can always climb the trees to the top without issue. But changing the size of these trees breaks this logic. So making a tree bigger in all directions will make it so instead of it behaving like a tree, it will behave like a wall. So the cat can no longer climb it. It also makes it deadly, as touching the giant roots will warp the player to the death plane beneath the stage. I'm not sure why that is. Making the tree thin and tall doesn't solve the issue either. Luigi will try to grab the weird invisible geometry around the tree, thus preventing him from hugging the tree like the cat ability normally does. 
The trees in the back of this level are classified as the tall variants of the bell tree, so now I'm gonna make them all different heights. Now, this does allow me to climb the tree, but as you can see, the interactable range for the tree doesn't match up with the model. I simply climb up to where the tree normally ends. Weirdly though, there's also the invisible collider preventing me from grabbing the tree too. And if I do hit it, Luigi will just momentarily grab the side of this invisible cylinder and not the hitbox for initiating a cat climb. Keep in mind, both these things occur because trees have different physics interactions based on if you're a cat or not. But that's all for Mount Beanpole, onwards to Plessy. Plessy's Plunging Falls, or Downriver Stage, as it's known internally, is a massive, beautiful map. Before entering this level, we can see Plessy on the world map is cut in half, and his model stops just beyond the water in this level diorama. I just love the scenery in this level. Look at all these waterfalls and high cliff sides. It's a super fun level to explore, as if you're a flying drone with a camera. Now, those of you who have watched this channel before know that I've messed with Plessy quite a bit in the past. Whatever direction Plessy is facing determines what way he will slide. And Plessy needs a stopping area defined so the player can actually climb off him. This is called a bobsled goal area. And we can move the one from the end of the map to the start. Now, when we jump on Plessy, we'll see that as soon as we start the race, the race is over and Plessy waves goodbye. This is because we landed in the goal box. However, it glitched the screen though because the launch event never finished. And as you can also see, we can walk around on the water because it's not actually water at all. It's impossible to climb these steep cliffs though, as the clatters on them go on for what seems like forever. The ramp at the end of the level has the collider lowered on it so Plessy's stomach can pass through it. And if we jump off this, we'll find that we can't stick to the wall like before. Down here is the only real water in this whole level, and even then you can walk along the edges of it. Moving into the middle makes you swim though. The giant drop actually doesn't have a real wall in the back, and it's a transparent one that prevents you from jumping out of the level. If we were to get past this, we can actually swim out a bit and go under the map. Unfortunately, all the walls around this entire level cannot be stood on. They all lack collision, and we simply fall through them. We cast a shadow on them, but the second we touch these grassy areas, we just fall on down. Now, the final goal area in this level takes place on a bridge, and it's unclear where this is on the map while playing, but it's actually just beyond the end of the race. A couple other interesting things you can't normally see here. One, with Splounders, these fish enemies, you can't normally see their bottoms when swimming from side to side. So, here you go. Something else that belongs on the mildly interesting subreddit is the skybox in this level isn't seamless. There is a big diagonal line across the sky where the skybox ends. The player camera can normally only face forward though, so this would usually be impossible to see. Let's move on to the next level. Time for the circus. Switch Scramble Circus is up next, which also goes by the name Flip Circus Stage. This level looks rather complicated when viewed through the editor, as a lot of areas are blocked off by invisible walls, which are these red or blue flat squares you see. Way out of bounds, we can find the area we get warped to when we enter the mystery box, and you'll notice there's some extra geometry hanging out beyond the walls. I'm not sure why this brick thing is over here. It's kind of neat looking at the rest of the level from this location though. So we're going to start off by deleting all these invisible walls and then loading up the map. Now we'll be able to fly around without getting stuck on walls. So normally you can't land up here because of the invisible ceiling, but these wooden beams up top can be stood on and explored. As we move on, you'll notice that parts of the map are missing. This is because when you open the gates by letting up all the switch panels, this also triggers new assets to load in on the map. So the spring platforms are currently just gone. We can walk on top of the edges of this area as well. If we skip past the heart gate, we'll see that nothing is really loaded at all. We can land on a random floating invisible platform though, way above the level. Not sure why this is here. But if we jump down below, everything is still gone and it's easy to die. If we fly straight into the mystery box, the second we complete it, we will then be ejected off the cliff and die. We're gonna now modify that first warp box to go to the mystery box area, but by doing so, we can skip the annoying timer that warps us back. Now we can explore this room. To my surprise, nothing outside this room had collision. Try to land on any part of this room, including the floor extensions made Luigi fall through it. Even areas where Luigi casted a shadow didn't mean anything. So it was a bit disappointing, but let's swap back to the start to the level real quick. So in the editor view, we can see that flip switch panels are actually originally placed out of bounds before they load in on each of the locations the lines point to. Every flip switch setup is constructed the same way in this level. Once the level loads, this out of bounds flip switch we see is no longer there as they're all placed correctly in the level. Bitty buds are a common enemy in the circus stage and these ladybug-like enemies always follow a path of some kind. What's interesting is that one bitty bud object behaves similarly to a stacked enemy. 
so we can simply increase the number of enemies in a line to an absurd number. And what we're left with is this insane ramly colored caterpillar enemy. A bitty bud! Uh, centipede. Woof. We can't destroy them all at once with the flip switches, but we don't get anything for it. We can make the bitty buds even bigger, and you get this really trippy oscillating slinky. At this point, all their eyes are just morphing together. Just jumping out to one of them initiates a ton of extra lives, and Luigi can do absolutely nothing as he gets all the prizes. Last but not least, we have the final giant circus tent at the end of the level. It's glorious, but I don't know the lore implications of this. However, something you would never know is that you can land on top of a certain part of the tent. There's an invisible barrier up there, and our cat lad can walk freely around. We're gonna hop over to the Toad stage now, as there isn't a whole lot to cover in it. Captain Toad Goes Forth is the stage name, known internally as Canopio Brigade 1010 Stage. So the Toad maps are different than normal 3D world levels, as the camera pivots around the stage and they utilize the gamepad. The levels are contained behind four invisible walls that cage it in. But what I found interesting is that these levels often sit on top of a base, like it's a diorama. If we increase the scale of this base slightly, and slide it out, we can see there are baked in shadows on the top that dissipate near the edges. We can also walk on this base too, despite the player never coming in contact with it. The toad level itself can be duplicated, rotated, and added next to itself to increase the scale of the level. The camera will just focus on the first level part though, unless we were to adjust the camera area view. We can also shrink down the stage and make it super, super small. Toad can still explore it, but he can't go inside it anymore. These stages can also hold regular enemies too, like if we decide to add Koopa Troopas. They increase the difficulty quite a bit because we can't jump, and falling onto another toad that we added, like this, softlocks the game since we have no way to recover. But let's move on to the final level, shall we? And now it's time for the grand finale in World 1, Bowser's Highway Showdown, also known as Koopa Chase Level 1 Stage. Now this stage is quite large. Taking a look behind the scenes, we can see that the entire boss fight area is stored behind where we start. It's also layered in the sky section by section, leading up to the flooding top of the castle. It's interesting, because the second track of this Bowser fight actually clips through the final castle area, and we just don't see this because it is unloaded at that point. So we're going to make a few changes to this map to see how things work here. We're going to bring one of these giant towers from the background to the start of the level. We are then going to take one of these smaller flame towers that appear when fighting Bowser and place them on the track. We are then going to take the middle track and rotate it slightly to see if we can mess up Bowser's driving. We'll throw one of these towers up here too. Lastly, we'll add some thwomps to the final section, put some bombs on the first bridge, and then duplicate Bowser's car and place it on the cutscene bridge at the very end. As a refresher, Bowser retreats away from the player as they try to run towards him. After the bridge ends that you are on, you then jump into a warp box to take you to the next bridge, which is above you, not in front of you. Once you get to bridge 3, the end of bridge 3 will warp you to the start of bridge 3, as it loops over and over. Let's test all this out now. So these background towers are way larger than they look, and they will only load in during certain camera angles. Trying to jump onto it is futile though, because we'll simply go right through it, as it does not have any collision. While we're down here though, this whole map has giant metal pipes running under the level. They are hollow inside, but you can never really get a good look at them. Anyways, now we can see we have towers and bombs on the first bridge, so we are going to activate Bowser. And Bowser is a bit busted. So we can see Bowser's car drive in from the sky, and it's a bit confusing at first. Then we realize the cutscene trigger activated the duplicate Bowser at the end of the level, and not the original one down below. This bugs out the camera, but creates something pretty funny. So the last frame of Bowser's cutscene animation gets stuck on the Bowser that loaded in down below. So, there's two Bowsers, and one is frozen. He doesn't seem to take damage either. So way up in the sky, Bowser is waiting for us in his car, and way down below on the bridge, we have his broken copy. We can actually climb inside his car, which is pretty neat. I didn't realize they made the whole interior so you could enter it. This Bowser won't move, so we are essentially stuck though because the warp box won't appear until he reaches the end of the bridge. Also, random, but in case you're curious, this intro cutscene area where Luigi is running into the castle doesn't exist on this map. It takes place in a separate file called the Demo Course Start Koopa Castle Stage, which is essentially a cutscene map file. The only thing in that map is the entrance and a cutscene version of the player. Also random, but the big Luigi sprite that is running through the ocean just vanishes under the water too. Back to the Bowser fight after fixing the duplication issue, you can see that Bowser drives through the towers we placed on the track. We can't though, which is surprising to me because there's no point in these towers having collision, since the player can't normally reach them. 
So as we enter this warp box, it looks like we are moving over to Bowser, but that's just an illusion as we warp high into the sky. Also, we can see that Bowser's car follows a set path, and our slight rotation to this bridge is causing him to clip through it, even though we don't. I had to move the warp box location, otherwise it would go on the ground. On bridge 3, the thwomps don't really do anything, so that's a bust. Now, at the end of bridge 3, in normal gameplay, the game actually duplicates Bowser's car and places it at the end of bridge 3 again. This is so that when we instantly warp back to the start of the bridge, Bowser is already there and ready to go. The camera can kill the player at this point, so it's very difficult to get a good look. The final castle area doesn't really have a whole lot going on, but we can fly the camera around and take a look anyways. With that though, we've come to the end of our World 1 adventure. Man, that was a doozy. I hope you learned something new in this video, and if you did, consider subscribing, and I'll see you all soon. Cheers!